If you were shot in the jungle of Vietnam, your survival chances were greater than if you were in a, a crash on a highway in America. That's how effective that helicopter was in that war. I was born in Phillips, South Dakota, and raised pretty much in the state of Washington. My father served with Darby's Rangers in World War II in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. <clears throat> I had an uncle that was in the Navy in World War II, and uh, the rest of them were just periodic here and there. All my children served in one way or another. Well, when I came out of uh, high school, uh, I went to an all-boys Catholic high school, and I had several scholarship offers to play football at different universities around the Northwest. But at the time, I was stalking this foxy chick, and she was going to a university uh, that Jesuit University that did not have a football team. So rather than lose her, I decided that I would go to the same university she went to. And when I got there, I found out they had ROTC, and it was mandatory, and I hated it. I did not like the idea that they could force me to wear a uniform and say, sir, to these kids around the campus. Uh, and so I didn't do well. And in fact, they booted me out. They told me to go to uh, summer camp one summer, and I decided I would go to Alaska in it instead. And so I went to Alaska to earn some money to go back to school. And then I married the foxy chick. And so she talked me into, she said, you need to go back and finish ROTC. And they actually took me back. A great, great leader there, a guy named Major Snyder, he said, we'll give you a second chance, Brady. And so they took me back into ROTC, and I was commissioned, and went into the military, did my basic training here. My first assignment was in Berlin, Germany. Of course, I remember most the fact that I was there before the wall, and I was there during the wall, when they built the wall, and after the wall. The most amazing thing about it was that before the wall, there was free access to all the sectors of Berlin. There were four different sectors of Berlin. The east was controlled by the Russians and the East Germans. The west was controlled by the French, the British, and the Americans. Free passage. One day, we woke up and there was barbed wire across the city. That was the 13th of August, 1961. And all of a sudden, they started to build a wall around their own people. And I'm a young second lieutenant and platoon leader, and they're shooting their own people off the wall. And my medics are cleaning up the mess. And this is when I first confronted communism. We had a babysitter who was engaged to be married to a gentleman in the East, she never saw him again. Our maid parents were in the East and she was not allowed to go to their funeral. So that woke me up. Before that, I had no idea of what communism was, how evil it was or anything about it. And it just kind of woke me up. And uh, I still had no aspirations of making the military a career. But I served with some great soldiers in Vietnam. Norm Schwarzkopf, my commander was a guy named Fred Wyan, later became Chief of Staff of the United States Army. And they were really extraordinary individuals. And I thought, geez, it might not be bad to grow up and be like one of those guys. So I went to, then from there, they sent me to flight school and I incurred an obligation. So it kind of kept me in the military. I uh, <clears throat> did my initial training at Camp Walters, Texas, uh, which is where they trained helicopter pilots. It didn't, uh, it's kind of an accident that I actually got to flight school. They didn't know what to do with me. I was kind of between assignments, and so they sent me to flight school. Difficult to get in in those days, really. And uh, I loved it because I got extra pay for being in flight school. And uh, the problem, though, was that my, my IP thought I was dangerous and it wasn't, didn't look like I was going to graduate. In fact, the day that I was supposed to solo, 
uh, he got out and he said, I'll give you one chance. And he put another IP in with me and he took me around the flight pattern just one time and he says, okay, you can solo. So I was within a few minutes of busting out of flight school. I was not a natural. He thought I was dangerous, but I did really enjoy it. In those days, the helicopters required both feet, both hands, and a wrist. You had a motorcycle grip in your left hand and uh, the power lever was in your left hand. Every time you moved one limb or your wrist, you had to move all the other three. So it was kind of like a harmony. Uh, and you had to be very, very well coordinated in those days to fly that kind of a helicopter. And so I would say that, that simple coordination, physical coordination was very important. And also your eyes were very important. Your vision was very, very important. And so I was blessed with good vision. I had reasonable coordination uh, once I caught on to it. But it took me a little while to catch on to the various movements required to fly a helicopter, including the motorcycle grip. Now the bad thing about that was it's the it was backwards from a motorcycle. So when you added power in a helicopter, you turned it one way, and when you added power in a motorcycle, you turned it the other way. So I pretty much fell off every motorcycle I tried to drive after I started flying helicopters. The development of a helicopter ambulance on the battlefield initially started in Burma in World War II, but it was not in any way effective or efficient or uh, sophisticated. Then they went to Korea where they had the MASH type helicopters with the pods and they would put the patient in that pod outside the helicopter where they couldn't treat him or monitor his condition en route to the hospital. Some of the patients would wake up in that pod and they thought they were in a coffin and it cost, caused them a little problem. Now by Vietnam we had the Huey, which was the, it was like coming out of the helicopters before the Huey was like going from Model A to a Rolls Royce. It was a beautiful machine. You could treat the patient in route. The problem was we didn't know yet how to handle it on the battlefield. And so initially in Vietnam, our mission was simply Americans. There were 16,000 of them in 1964. And that was it even though most of the casualties in those days were being suffered, suffered by the Vietnamese people. And so uh, we had a commander, a guy named Charles Kelly, who was an incredible soldier, probably the greatest individual soldier I've ever known. Veteran of World War II, kind of an irascible Irishman. He was court-martialed three times in World War II, almost died in one battle, but he came to Vietnam to command this unit. They decided, Stillwell, General Stillwell, decided he would use our helicopters for ash and trash, and then when there was a patient, he'd put a red cross on it. Kelly said, no, no, you can't do that. Now, you got a major going up against a general, both of them World War II veterans. Kelly did not back down. Our mission was in doubt uh, until the day Kelly was killed. And when he was killed, that changed everything. It took his life. He went in to pick up an American. Uh, they came under fire. They told him, get out. He said, when I have, you're wounded. And boom, he took one bullet through the open door, right through the heart, killed him on the spot. He froze, destroyed the helicopter. They dragged him out. Doctor was on board, broke the doctor's leg, and the rest of them weren't hurt too bad. So I was on my way down there when we heard he was done. And in fact, I replaced him as commander of that unit that day, that night, I slept in his bunk. In fact, I went into that area where he had been killed a few minutes after he was shot to get the patients that he was killed trying to get. I got him out, although we got shot up on the first approach. Uh, but we did get him out. And the American who we went to pick up walked to the aircraft with a R&R &R bag in his hand. He wasn't urgent or anything else. So, But it didn't matter. He, Kelly would have gone after him anyhow. By the way, his dying words, when I have your wounded, set the standard for dust off to this day. 
and you will not find one dust off pilot anywhere in the world, helicopter ambulance pilot, who does not use those words as his motto to this day. As I said, I took over his detachment that, that day that he was killed and moved my stuff into his room. And the battalion commander called me in that day. And he said to me, he said, you know, I knew somebody was going to get killed the way you people were flying. He said, but I didn't think it would be Kelly. I thought it would be one of the younger pilots because all of us were inexperienced right out of flight school. And so I said, no, we're not going to change a thing. We're going to keep on flying the same way he taught us because we don't know any other way. And then when I left, he gave me, he actually gave me the bullet that killed Kelly. I have it to this day. I offered it to the family, but they didn't take it. They may in the future. But in any event, uh, that's it. We, we kept flying the way we, we've always flown and, and because we didn't know any other way. And Kelly taught us, and as I said, he set the example, and his moral courage saved dust off and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives as a result. One man, one man, made an incredible difference. The survival rate, because of Kelly, in Vietnam, if you were shot in the jungle of Vietnam, your survival chances were greater than if you were in a, a crash on a highway in America. That's how effective that helicopter was in that war. When I came back in 1967, much had changed. There was about 500,000 Americans in country and they were killing that many every week. So the worst part of it was that we were in the mountains in tough terrain and I had 12, well I had 11 other pilots, most of them had graduated from flight school on the same day. There was no checkout, there was no nothing. When they got to Vietnam and we got our helicopters, they started flying combat. So in this case, most of our patients were Americans and we had to deal with weather and we had to deal with mountains and we had to deal with pilots who were totally inexperienced. I was the only experienced pilot. Me and the one other pilot had uh, I had a year of combat experience and he had a year in Vietnam. Some of it was flying. We were based at Chu Lai, which is about 20 minutes south of Da Nang, which is a big city in the northern part of South Vietnam in those days. We had a 40-man detachment. We had uh, six helicopters. And to give you an idea of the workload, and you can do kind of do the numbers on this, but in a nine and a half month period with three flyable aircraft, we had an aircraft shot up by enemy about every four or five days. 117% of our aircraft were shot up every month. In that 40 man detachment, there were 26 Purple Hearts. That means 26 people were wounded out of the 40 man detachment. In that nine and a half month peri period, despite all those adversities, we carried over 21,000 patients. That was more than were carried by helicopter in the entire Korean War and as just one unit. All the other dust off units were doing the same thing. Thousands and thousands of patients, saving thousands and thousands of lives. I was scared to death of the weather uh, and the mountains and the fact that they were going to start killing our pilots because we were losing more pilots to accidents at night and in weather than the enemy was killing. So I got a call one day from a young trooper who was on a mountaintop and he'd been bitten by a snake. In, in the afternoon the clouds would come down over the mountains about halfway down. So complete zero visibility. Underneath it clear visibility. But in order to get to the kid on the mountaintop, we had to go into the clouds. No radar control, no letdown facilities, no nothing. And so I came into the clouds knowing I could fall out into the valley and I would be visual, but I didn't have any idea how I was going to get that kid out. In the meantime, I'm praying like crazy, asking the good Lord to show me how to do it. The crew is nervous. They're screaming at me on the ground. 
he's going into convulsions, death stop, please, please. I told him we gotta try it one more time. So we went back around, back up the mountain, into the soup, and I was blown sidewards. The, that was the breath of God, and I looked out my window. I was looking for a hole in the jungle. I thought we were gonna crash. And I could see the tip of the rotor blade, and I could see the top of the trees. So guess what? I knew I was right side up. So I turned that thing sidewards, up the mountain, into the area, got the kid, got him to the hospital, and I think he lived. That was a technique from that moment on, low valley fog, afternoon buildup, two reference points, sidewards, and you can get in. They can't stop us. And so the day of the Medal of Honor action, they called me because it was one of those missions and they knew I could fly. The fog was perfect, perfect protection from the enemy because he could not see more than 20 feet in that stuff. Now, on one of the missions, we went and we flew right over the top of him and whole, an NVA unit was laying in the mud right under us, but he, we were only about 15, 20 feet off the ground, but he couldn't see us or until we got there, he could see us and before he could do anything, we were gone. So it was perfect, perfect protection. You just had to know how to do it. And so I went into that area and picked a, those Vietnamese up and it was not a problem. They had 70 patients in another location, also under low valley fog. And so we went out there and we got all them out using the same technique. They tried to follow me in, but they didn't know how to do it. And so I had to go get them all by myself. And the other missions were just routine missions where we went in to get patients and we got our aircraft damaged by enemy fire. The most important thing is that they're ready when you get there that the medic on the ground has done the most he can for him, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, treat for shock. In essence, what you do is you make sure he's getting one thing, air, and you protect what he's got of the other thing, blood. And then you get him on the helicopter and then our medic goes to work on him and, and does more work on him and he's gonna be, he's gonna be in the hospital in 15 minutes. He's gonna be in an operating room and. And from the time a guy was shot in our area until we had him in an operating room, the average time was 33 minutes. So no matter what condition, he could be a double amputee, he could be anything. And if he wasn't already dead, the chances were 99% that he was going to live because we were going to have him in an operating room very, very quickly. Most of the time, the automatic weapons were 30 caliber. The one that really worried you uh, was quad 50s and we got hit with quad 50s one night and it blew the top off the helicopter. A 50 caliber was the roughest thing. We didn't have to go up against missiles, thank God. Uh, but uh, 30 caliber, we knew, pretty much knew that 2,000 feet put us out of range of 30, uh, 30 caliber or 7.62 or whatever the enemy had, and then 3,000 feet would put us out of range of a 50 caliber. Although we had guys flying, flying along at night in the black at night and have a pilot around come up through the bottom of the helicopter and hit, shoot one of the pilots. We went into the area and uh, we got shot up, but we didn't know how bad the aircraft was damaged. So we jumped out of the area, we went up to altitude, checked it out. The instruments were good. The aircraft was, seemed to be flying good, and so we went back in and we got the patients. When we got back to the base, they found out that the controls were partially shot away. So we had to, they were just hanging on by the skin of our teeth. Uh, so, but anyhow, we had to get another helicopter, and then we went out again. The interesting thing about <clears throat> the minefield was we were not on that mission. Another dust-off aircraft had that mission. And as we were coming over the top, there was a lot of traffic about wounded in the minefield. Everybody was apparently dead or wounded. And a mine went off beside the helicopter it was sitting on the ground, the dust-off, and it left the area. And so I saw where that helicopter was sitting. I knew just about exactly where its skid marks were. So I knew that if I could hit those skid marks, I wouldn't set off a mine when I landed. Two things landing, one if you, if you land on a mine or it's command detonated, that's a problem. But the other thing was <clears throat> the rotor, 
when you change power, the downdraft can set off a mine. So <clears throat> I hit the sky, I hit the spot right on the mark. Things are going good. Nobody will move. My my medic and crew chief, I turned to him and I said, "Go get him." And they jumped out of that helicopter and they started dragging people to the helicopter through the minefield. Nobody would help them. Nobody would move. And so on one of the trips, they set off a mine, <clears throat> blew them up in the air, filled the aircraft with shrapnel. Lights came on, they landed, they had a patient on a litter, and I think he took most of the shrapnel from the mine. Although some people think it was command detonated, I don't know. Uh, but in any event, they got up, they got the rest of the patients loaded, got them on the aircraft, we took them to the hospital, including my two crew members who were wounded, and uh, then we had to go get another helicopter. I got a call from Westmoreland's office one day, and he said, uh, congratulations, uh, this is a Major Scott. Congratulations, you're going to get the Medal of Honor. Now, I had already gotten my second Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest award, and uh, had a ceremony and everything. I didn't think anything about the Medal of Honor, but what they did is they upgraded. It was an interim award while they processed the Medal of Honor. It took two years to process it. And so I was, I was completely surprised. But the beautiful thing was that uh, you got to bring your family and I got to bring a lot of my friends to the White House for the ceremony. And that was great. The thing I remember was that I was just really kind of embarrassed because when I stood up there at the guys, there were three other guys with me. I thought, what's going on here? You know, the, everybody, the people in my unit, every other pilot except for the weather missions, Every other pilot in that unit did the same thing I did, got shot down as many times as I did, carried as many patients as I did, almost, because I had a year on them. And, uh, and so I was just, just a little bit embarrassed. The most interesting thing about the whole ceremony was that President Nixon said before the ceremony, he said, you know that the Medal of Honor Society is meeting at the uh, Shamrock Hotel in Houston, Texas. We didn't know what the Medal of Honor Society was. And he said, well, let, those are the living recipients of the medal. At that time, there was like 400 of them. They went back to the Boxer Rebellion. And uh, would you like to go? to the? Because now, tomorrow, after this ceremony, you will be members of that society. And we said, sure, how will we get there? He says, take Air Force One. So he put us on his airplane, which was not Air Force One when he wasn't on it. But so we went down there and we walked into that crowd and there was Bob Hope and Dinah Shore and Scooter Burke and Eddie Rickenbacker and Jimmy Doodlittle and Commando Kelly and Joe Foss and all these incredible heroes from as ba far back as I said, the Boxer Rebellion, the Indian Wars, and here we are. Four young troopers and they're all out there to greet us and uh, it was just a great experience. I think service is, is the thing that stands out. And I think that uh, I, was a, I was a reluctant soldier, God knows. I didn't want anything to do with the uniform or the military or anything about it. And had I not gone to Berlin, had I not been forced to join the military, had I not had to do things that I didn't want to do and would have never done if it was up to me, uh, the lesson was that I wouldn't trade a minute of it. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I think that young people today need to have that same opportunity to serve their country, uh, to do something for somebody else besides themselves, which is what military service is all about. Soldiers, they believe that life has no meaning unless it's lived for the benefit of future generations. That's what it's all about. That's why they protect America. It's not for just for them is for future generations. And so everybody should have a little bit of that in them, I think. And the one place to get it is in the military where they train in grain and make you believe that. And so that's what that's the way you live your life as a soldier.